Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and with me, as always, are my fabulous co-hosts. Hey, Rob, it's me, Diana. And it's me, fabulous third person, Jackie. Just you know, That's usually how we describe you, Jackie. Third it's like, oh, here's Jackie my uh, third person. It's Jackie McDonald. <laughs> Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, we're not going to beat around the bush because we are recording early today because we have a million places to be. That doesn't mean we're going to give this episode short shrift. You know, this episode about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research in which we will discuss relevant research related to a given topic. But it does mean we need to be a bit more succinct than usual, <laughs> which I might say is <laughs> idiosyncratic to our podcast, where we like to sort of just meander and see where the topics take us. Mm. And how are we feeling about these topics? Topics. So today it's going to be right to the point. So that's a little strange for us, which probably makes sense because today we're going to be talking about the strangeness that can come up when you're conducting a functional analysis in the form of looking for idiosyncratic variables in modifying a standard functional analysis, which is, hey, that's our topic. Look at that. What a segue. Who knew I could get there? So we're going to be talking about research related to the idea that standard functional analysis, i.e. our kind of Awada et al. 8294 analysis with our four major conditions, doesn't always result in differentiation so that we're able to determine the function of a problem behavior and therefore develop a function-based treatment. And sometimes you have to mess around a bit. And I think this is where understanding the functions of behavior and really doing the active behavior analysis really comes in rather than just being a series of tricks that we know how to do and a procedure that we can follow. And that's going to lead us into what I guess, honestly, probably is the most idiosyncratic FA of all, the interview-informed synthesized contingency analysis, which we've discussed before on the show, but we are going to discuss in a little bit more detail today as well, sort of as a an offshoot of this process, this overall process. So why don't we just very quickly talk about everyone's history with FAs. We've all done FAs. We enjoy FAs. Diane and I, one of our first dates, we did an FA. It wasn't a date at the time, but you know, we, we've kind of <laughs> we've retconned that into a date because I think it makes for a better story. What does that mean? What is a retcon? It's like you go back and you're like, this thing happened, and it really happened this way, but because the narrative makes more sense if we pretend it happened this way, let's let's all choose to agree that's actually the story. Oh, okay. Yeah. It's like, you know, Bucky got killed, you know, Captain America sidekick Bucky got killed, and then they decided, no, let's bring him back. And so they retconned the story so that he didn't actually get killed. He just, you know, got hurt really bad. And then here's he came our, back. Here's our meandering again. Yeah. It's so hard for us. <laughs> That's our Marvel minute, you know. You gotta get you gotta get those clicks. You gotta talk about Marvel movies in your podcast, or else it doesn't count. It doesn't count. So when when you know our histories with functional analyses. I know that's something that I spend a lot of my time doing because most of my job is help, help. Someone is struggling and there's a high rate of a problem behavior. Why are they doing it? What can we do to support them and help them? What are the skills they're missing? So I, for a very long time, have used standard FAs. I've sort of, you know, much more moved into using the practical functional assessment procedure myself just for a lot of reasons, some of which we'll talk about today, some of which we talked about on older episodes. I'm glad you do FAs, Rob, because in the introduction of my study that was published in 2020, they said that almost 63% of BCBAs reported that they almost never or never conduct FAs during their job. <gasps> that seemed like a My lot. monocle yeah. flew across the room at that <laughs> statement. Yes, it is true. And there are a lot of factors that go into it, one of which is it can be annoying to spend the hours it can take to do a functional analysis and then get undifferentiated results, which is often a challenge. So a lot of what we're going to talk about today is the FA and making the process better so that more people can use it. And I think there's some kind of good directions to go into, but we'll, we'll get into that. Sure. But both of you, big fans of functional analyses, I know knowing functions of behavior, but that's not, not really your, your day job anymore. Nope. Professors. Nope. I do collect some, I have a side hobby, right, where I direct an autism center. And mm -hmm. so we do do some It's fun to stay busy. There. Yeah. <laughs> So, but I don't directly do them. I only supervise and consult toward them. Mm. So yeah, I'm, Diana does that as well. So that's kind of where, what we do with FAs. My favorite FA is the trial-based FA. Just putting it out there. Well, really, I have a colleague who is a huge, actually, she, you know, friend of the show, Colleen Callahan, who was on to talk about VB map. She loves trial-based mm -hmm. trial FAs. Like, weirdly, a little too much. Same. Like, there was, a, I had a period, I, I, did, I dabbled. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to admit, when I was younger, I did dabble in the trial-based FA, but it is sort of, Fallen out of favor. I don't. It's 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 not as not as beautiful as it used to be in my Still eye. My favorite, but that's okay. So, what do you want to tell us about the articles, Diana? Yeah, what are we reading? Well, what have we read? Hopefully, 
<laughs> yes, I am going to do that. So we have four articles that we'll talk about today. They include idiosyncratic variables that affect functional analysis outcomes, a review from 2001 to 2010, and that was by Schlickenmeyer, Roscoe, Rooker, Wheeler, and Doobie, published in Java 2013. Interview-informed synthesized contingency analyses, 30 replications and reanalysis by Jessel, Hanley, and Gamagami. That was in Java 2016. Interview-informed synthesized contingency analysis, ISCA, novel interpretations in future directions by Coffey, Schaller, Jessel, Nye, Bain, and Dorsey. That was published in Behavior Analysis and Practice 2020. And then... I don't know where we're going to discuss this one, so I may not have put them in the right order, but we also will tangentially mention functional analysis screening for problem behavior maintained by automatic reinforcement by Querum, Awada, Roscoe, Schlickemeyer, Ortega, and Hurl. That was in Java 2013. So full disclosure, one of these articles is not like the other one, but yes. when it was mentioned in, I believe it was the coffee article, they sort of mentioned it is. And then the, here's one you can do too, the Querum and all. We've never, I don't think we've ever talked about it. I, I mean, I never, I looked it no. up in our archive. We never talked about Querum and all 2013. And that's one of my favorite FA articles. Like it is one that I've cited in <laughs> protocols I've written probably since like 2013, like when I used to do a lot of treatment for stereotypy behavior in schools, I would cite that article as part of our screening process. Like I wrote protocols with it in there and we just never talked about it. I don't know when we're ever going to talk about it. So I said, you know what? It kind of fits here. So I shoved it in. So we'll briefly review it at the back end of the episode. Anyone listening to this podcast probably said idiosyncratic FAs. That's great because I know a lot about standard FAs. But just in case you accidentally clicked on this one and you're like, I don't know what a standard FA is, or maybe you're just new, newer to the field, the standard FA that we'll be sort of referring to and talking about research that builds off of is going to refer to the protocol laid out in Awada et al. in 1982 and then republished in 1994. So that's sort of our four standard condition. Since I'm I'm going to be going first because I have kind of the earliest article, would someone else like to describe the basics of the functional analysis so I don't just talk straight for 30 minutes? Sure, I can do it very succinctly. So the four conditions... Oh, then I should probably do it then, the Jack. Play, so I meander. <laughs> the play yeah. condition is the condition that's supposed to represent an enhanced environment where theoretically behavior should not occur. So it would have a lot of attention, no demands... Lots of toys, right? It should be the enhanced choice. Sometimes people will also put an alone condition in there as a control condition, but the play should be the alone. The play should be the control condition where behavior should not occur. Then we have our demand condition where we're assessing if problem behavior occurs as a result of demand. So you'd say like, do this, and if they have problem behavior, you say, oh, you don't have to do that, and you remove the contingencies. That's literally my favorite. Oh, you don't have to do that anymore. The attention condition is you removing your attention contingent on problem behavior. You're providing attention. Yeah, that's, there you go. That's that. And then the alone condition is when the child is either alone in a room or for younger children or children that don't like to be alone, it's a no interaction condition. We're in the room with them, but you're not interacting with them. Right. I usually prefer that one. It seems weird to just be yes. like, see you later, and then <laughs> yeah. like just shut a door. Enjoy this we closet. Would, that would come yeah. up at yeah. some point. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, so that I don't recommend. I think the last time I ran a real alone condition was sometimes in schools, if we have like little class, like our sub separate classrooms of those cubbies that you can work in, sometimes you'll be like, I'm just going to be right over here. And then you just can go out of eyesight, but you're still kind of in the classroom with the student. The last time I think I was like, I'm closing this door and I'm leaving and there was no one and nothing in this room probably was when I worked at New England Center for Children and we had like rooms specifically for FAs with video feeds so you could keep an eye on the, on the students. Because otherwise you're just like, Here's a room. Maybe there's a window. And I don't know. I don't know about you. It's not really an alone condition if occasionally you're peeking your head right. into the tiny window to make sure that the child is okay. Yeah. I think that it, usually you should just use a no interaction. Yeah. yeah. All right. So those are our main conditions. Tangible can be added. However, none of the sort of idiosyncratic FA research we discussed here really goes into the idea of tangible items exactly. I have uh, a few. Well, I mean, the, in, the, in the ISCA portion, but none of the sort of like standard additions can go into that. But again, that would just be the matter of is problem behavior maintained by access to items, activities. You would just deliver the item or activity after some period of time where the child gets to play. You'd say, my turn and take everything away. If problem behavior occurs, oh, you must want this back and you give the item back. So... Already hearing us sort of talk about just the standard FA, there's a lot of room for sort of minor accidental idiosyncratic procedures in that none of these are exactly scripted out. I mean, I guess depending on your company, there's lots of ways you can give attention. There's lots of ways you can provide a demand or remove that demand or provide items or give no interaction. You know, there's lots of yeah, small... 
not to mention the the type and quality of the consequence that's being provided. Like we're sort of like broadly saying, oh, it fits into one of these four categories, but there are a myriad of different ways in which any one of those might actually be represented or actually function to maintain behavior. Mm -hmm. So just saying like, oh, attention. And every time it's attention, it's no, no, don't do that. You'll hurt yourself. Well, that doesn't mean that that's exactly what that child is experiencing in real life or that that is what that child might be seeking. Mm -hmm. And when we look at sort of functional analysis research, you sort of have the beginnings of functional analysis research and the idea of what if functional analysis. And that would sort of be like the 80s up to sort of like the late 90s. And then really in the 2000s and into the 2010s, you would see a lot of research saying FAs kind of take a long time. If you don't get differentiated results right away, what are you supposed to do next? And so that sort of became the next line of research, which sort of brings us up to the modern day, which is, you know, does one even do sort of the traditional analog functional analysis anymore? Or do we use one of the other sort of technologies that have, you know, budded off of that original research? So leading up to the Schlickenmeyer et al. 2013 article, we sort of have seen FAs being something that are, you know, we all agree, amazing, a huge push into our field, into coming up with function-based treatments in an efficient way. However, is it efficient enough? Can we speed up the process? Because sort of the research up to now had pointed to if you're doing FAs that have conditions that are less than about 10 minutes, you start losing a lot of meaningful experimental control. You start getting a lot less differentiated results. So sort of 10 minutes became the gold standard. What was the original? Like 15 minute sessions? Mm -hmm. so I think 10 minutes is considered well, like pretty good. Five minutes is is what people typically now do, I think. Yeah, but five and five minutes is sort of starts getting into that iffy territory of it's not bad, but it's not quite as good. So when you're looking at an FA, you're doing at least three repetitions of those four conditions at ten minutes each. So that's 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 quite a chunk of time. And then if at the end of those you've got your you know, your twelve data points and you don't see any differentiation, so problem behavior is all over the place or problem behavior isn't occurring at all, you need to continue running conditions. And looking at the research in the Schlickenmeyer article, you know, Schlickenmeyer and colleagues cite Kurtz did a study in 2003 saying that a review of FAs, 12.5% of cases uh, were not getting differentiated results. Hanley, Iwata, and McCord, 2003, which again is cited in a lot of FA articles because it's a really good kind of review or historical review of FAs, didn't see the ability to identify what was the maintaining reinforcer in about 4.2% of published cases. So this is just published cases. Now, anyone who's done an FA that, of course, never got published because you were doing it as part of your job has probably got some percentage where you could not get differentiated results. And then the question becomes, do I know enough about the function to come up with a treatment, which is what everyone really wants? Do I keep running conditions? And you can have those FAs that, you know, you're running like, you know, 22, 23, 24 sessions before you even get any differentiation. And that's if you were able to kind of somehow figure out what tweaks needed to be made. And I know it sometimes seems like, wow, that ISCA research, that's like magic. But a lot of professionals who've been doing this a long time probably inadvertently did some form of a synthesized functional analysis way before 2014's publication because you just had to say something like, I'm not getting good results. What might it be? Oh, I bet it's I'm not using the right work. And then you sort of switch. Oh, I bet it's a combination of this and that. Let's smoosh it together. One article I really like too, if you're looking for other variations of FAs, is they kind of smog together is Iwata and Dozier, and I think it's 2008. They give you all the different variations, too, that probably led to the idea of these variations. But I love that article. Yeah. We're not reviewing it because it's just a review. Like yeah. It doesn't make sense to review that one. But if students are looking to find one paper that shows you Without the ISCA there, because the ISCA hasn't been created yet, the graphs of every single different FA design that you could have from the multi-element to the trial base and how you graph them to the latency to the mini FA, this is a great paper to mm. do that one. Yeah, and you can also go back to our interview with Jess Slayton, where we talked about just the, the overall history of synthesis in functional analyses. So there's a lot of places you can continue getting more information. But based on those results, Schlickenmeyer and colleagues said, you know, is there a process for those undifferentiated FAs in which researchers were able to come up with a system of, here is how I can look for some sort of idiosyncratic. So in the sense of some sort of a detail that is very specific to this participant that uh, will allow for better differentiation. And so if we review all the papers where there was any kind of modification of the FA based on some of these idiosyncratic elements, 
do we find patterns? Do we find any way to do a procedure so that no matter who you are, you're able to sort of go through maybe the checklist of idiosyncratic FA modifications to get more differentiated results much faster in your analysis than sort of running 30 sessions and then saying, I don't know what's going on, and then sort of guessing and trying things until you eventually come up with the solution. So it's a review paper of all uh, FAs from the 10 years prior to publication, so 2001 to 2010, looking at idiosyncratic antecedent and consequence modifications to the FA procedure, and what were the steps taken to modify the FA? So can we find some patterns that practitioners could use? And this was pretty easily done by searching through sort of research search engines for the words function, analysis, and behavioral assessment, which is what you would do. And then finding any paper that had some sort of experimental manipulation and design to identify the functional relations, and then had some additional modification. So if it was just your standard four-condition FA, we got great results and did a treatment, throw it out. It's not interesting for the purposes of this paper. So from that, they were able to find 42 articles that had those idiosyncratic manipulations. Couldn't just be advances in practice, though we're going to fudge that a little bit in our definition of what goes into the episode about idiosyncratic FAs. So what they found were kind of categorized by antecedent and consequent manipulations based on the general function, so social negative, social positive. So in terms of looking at social negative relations, so sort of our escape condition, there were a lot of antecedent manipulations that could happen. About 10 articles looked at varied task demands. So basically, depending on what demand you used, did different demands have different evocative effects? So some articles, they used a demand assessment, like Eileen Roscoe is, she, I feel like has a whole great series of articles in which it's, here's how to do an assessment to find the thing you want to use in your FA. There's a bunch of those. But demand assessment uh, was one of, one of the ones that was cited here to identify what tasks should we be using to make sure that you are evoking problem behavior. Some of them just were things like, hey, in let's- In the sense that mm-hmm. you want it to you know, mimic as closely as possible the real life EO. Yes, Exactly. To do that, you could also just ask people, what demands does this kid not really like? And then we're able to sort of demonstrate that depending on the demand, you did or did not evoke problem behavior by its presentation and then escape from that demand. Three articles looked at what if we vary the dimensions of the task itself. So again, this is a little similar to looking at the varied task demands, but you could play around with the idea of the difficulty of the task, the preference for tasks, how many tasks or the magnitude of the tasks. And you just use simple definitions, or the researchers use simple definitions, like uh, a difficult task is one that a student completes with lower accuracy, or a non-preferred task is one that the child rarely chooses independently or spontaneously to engage with, could have more evocative effects on problem behavior and evoke more problem behavior in the assessment. Sometimes you would modify the amount. So there was one study they referred to where they just gave less work and saw less problem behavior. That's what I feel like sometimes. Yeah, less work, less problem behavior. Right, right. I'm just going to get a shirt. <laughs> more work, more problems. <laughs> Five articles looked at varying the instructional style. So, quote, quote, unquote, abrasive instructions given, which they refer to as having a tense face and being louder and exclamatory as a more evocative of problem behavior or more able to evoke problem behavior. Looking at the differences in types of prompting, vocal versus physical prompting, looking at whether reprimands or corrective feedback were given immediately following errors or given later on after the error had occurred. So with the distance between the error and the feedback, I actually did uh, a practical functional assessment recently where we were specifically looking at the type of prompt given as a really as a mediating factor in whether or not we you know we could reliably evoke problem behavior. It was uh, it was kind of interesting to then see this in in the article as something that yeah just people had to figure this out at, at points in time before articles like this came out. Even things like what rules were given in the in the instruction. So one student uh, in one paper found if they said if you have problem behavior then you're going to go to timeout actually resulted in lower rates of problem behavior than if they said, if you have problem behavior, I'm going to take this work away. Like that actually evoked problem behavior. So just the type of instruction given. So it could be something very specific when we talk about the idiosyncratic features. Sometimes combining attention, which we'll talk about more in some of the other articles, combining attention with that escape actually led to higher rates of problem behavior or more differentiation of problem behavior in the demand condition. 
And then in uh, five studies, they just did some sort of different antecedent things that had nothing to do with the types of instructions. So one student hated being in a wheelchair when they had demands presented. Some hated when people also were giving attention during the presentation of demands. Some students didn't like having specific prompts about, you know, walking or transitioning between activities, even though it was the same activity done in a new location. If you said we're doing math, no problem. If you said we're doing math, and then said, now we're going to walk over here and do math, that would evoke problem behavior. So again, these idiosyncratic variables were very specific to the participant, and again, may not be relevant to you and your student. Looking at the social positive relation, so again, the behavior that you'd see during the attention condition, there were some antecedent and consequent manipulations. So things they looked at were, what about you know, specific idiosyncratic putative MOs for attention is sort of how they phrased it. So things like, hey, what if I diverted my attention to another person? Or what if as part of my removal of attention in the condition, I actually left the whole room, not just turned away or looked at my magazine or looked at my data sheet. Some of it was about having access to items that the child liked during the attention condition and not letting them have them, plus the presentation of attention uh, following the, the problem behavior. And for one individual, it had to be specifically their items. It couldn't just be any item. So it had to be magazines with their name on the mailing address. And I'm taking this magazine. I'm going to read it. That's what I'm doing while you're playing with the other you know, preferred items during the attention condition. That could evoke problem behavior. Another study even looked at combining antecedent manipulations, which, again, is not new nowadays, but in 2013 was something that you know, wasn't necessarily published quite as much. So task materials plus diverted attention or task materials plus denial of access to a high preference item. Some consequent manipulations in the social positive or kind of the, you know, what you think of as the attention condition would be looking at idiosyncratic positive re re reinforcers. So looking at specific form of attention. So some children respond to attention when it's in the form of reprimand or in the form of comments that are unrelated to the problem behavior. Some like physical, the physical component of attention, which is usually why you give both physical and verbal sort of attention in that condition. And again, different forms could function as reinforcers for different participants, as well as different consequences like access to ritualistic behavior, specific types of play items, specific types of high preference items, combining the tangible plus attention. So it's not so good that I get my iPad, but I need to have iPad plus I need you to play with me while I'm on the iPad. So again, None of this is, I think if anyone's read PFA or the ISCA literature, some of this seems very like, yeah, of course, that's, that's what people talk about doing all the time. But at least as of 2013, this was still not exactly novel, but novel in the published research. And then even automatic reinforcement, it, depending on whether there are items present or not present, you might see differentiation. So in a lone condition, having no responding, but when you just put items in the environment, a high rate of responding suddenly occurs, even though that's really the only change. So... It does seem like there are lots of little things that can change your results in an FA. Even things like, was someone sick? Were there noises in the environment while the FA was happening? These are some other, they call just other contextual variables because they don't really relate to the procedure. The other category. The other category. The amount of rapport between the therapist and the participant where less rapport meant more problem behavior. Which, again, you might not think of. You're like, oh, here's your favorite teacher. They'll do your FA with you. You should probably have picked someone who they've never met before. But again, that's not always the case. It's idiosyncratic. And the idea that the controlling variables might change across sessions. They talked about one study where the FA found a tangible function when it was completed in the student's classroom, but it found a completely different function, an attention function, when they ran the same procedure out on the playground. So again, the context is going to be relevant, possibly all the time, but certainly in this context of uh, kind of idiosyncratic variables or undifferentiated results. So again, the end of this is now, what would you do with this information? So they looked at, well, how did people come to all these really cool conclusions? Because you read these and it's just it's like, it's like a mystery. You know, oh, they solved all these problems. But when they looked at the research to sort of talk about, well, how did these really brilliant people find these idiosyncratic variables? About 28% of the studies just sort of, you know, watched the student for a while and said, I don't know, let's add this. About 26% just kind of had these anecdotal reports of saying, hey, you know, sometimes this for the student. They often have problem behavior when they can't play with these gun toys, but they don't care about these other toys as much. Great. Throw it in the FA. 19% of the studies actually did more formal. Check it in the blender. Yeah, just throw it all in there, right? 19% looked at, they actually did a descriptive assessment in addition to the FA to sort of add to the FA components. 
16% did manipulation and observation, which wasn't super well defined, but to me just sort of sounded like while they were watching the FA, they said, I don't know. I noticed this seems to be happening. What if we add this component? It seems like when the reprimand is the attention, they seem like they don't like that as much. So let's just do that more consistently. Kind of seemed like what that part was. 7% of the articles they reviewed did some other indirect assessment, like a preference assessment or demand assessment. And then 30% just sort of did something and didn't explain why. Just they, they noted that they changed it and no clue as to why. So 42 studies had about 30 different idiosyncratic variables that seemed to influence the FA results. A lot of the time, it seemed like the main ones were things like changing antecedent variables in the demand conditions, looking at different classes of you know, putative EOs in the positive reinforcement or sort of like the social positive conditions seems to be the main sort of categorization of what these idiosyncratic variables look like. And most of the articles usually just did it in the form of, I did a standard FA. I did not get differentiation. Then I started making different results. Some of these articles actually looked at these variables sort of as a means of sort of drilling down into the detail of the relevant variables to make a better treatment afterwards. So you're left at the end of this article with kind of the issue of there's no real way that you could consistently find your idiosyncratic variables, though they may exist. The question then becomes, should you try to use modified conditions at the beginning, or should you do a standard FA, then add modified conditions as you get no results? So the authors here would say standard FA and then add modifications because it's the most efficient. Because if you start throwing things into your standard FA that may not need to be there, are you going to get a lot of false positives in terms of the results of your condition? Are you going to be developing a treatment that takes into account idiosyncratic variables that had no reason to be in the study? But how would you ever modify the standard FA? Well, you know, you just do, which, again, is disheartening. And when faced with the idea of would you like to do this thing that could take like, you know, one and a half to two or three hours and you might get no results and then you get to guess about what you want to add to get better results or would you like to use something like the PFA process? I understand why that seems to be getting more traction in the behavior analytic community these days because – it's sort of go, you know, refuting the idea of start with your standard and then add the conditions instead saying, let's find all the idiosyncratic variables and start there. But again, that's another article. Yeah, and you have to remember that was 2003. Oh, right? 13. 13, but still, 2013, like the ISCA hasn't even been created yet. No, I'm not mad so. at these authors for no. coming to this conclusion. <laughs> that's just a conclusion they had at the time. Right, so, but I do, as you listen, right, you forget when it was published. That's why I'm like bringing it back that's true that it's not re i mean it's relevant right but it's not as relevant as it could be if it was published in 2022 no but i right? think the I, I think it is interesting to kind of go back now that we're sort of where we are and look at what is the historical context yes. of why oh, these modifications agree. need to be a component or why people are so interested in these modifications right. you know you cite most people aren't using fas one of the reasons people don't use fas is because they take a long time and because if the results are bad you're sort of stuck second guessing what am I supposed to do next and there's not any real movement as to an exact procedure to follow. Now again, if you've done a number of FAs, if you've been a behavior analyst for a while, if you're paying attention to a lot of variables, you might pick out some of these idiosyncratic variables. But I know I got cold sweats every time I did an FA of what if this is one of the ones that they describe in the idiosyncratic review paper and I can't I'm not smart enough to figure out that one little piece that's missing. Good thing you wear an undershirt that day. <laughs> so that brings us to I think sort of the, the next phase in FAs. But before we get into that, let's take a little break and then we'll come back and talk more about idiosyncratic FAs. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Masters of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Masters of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. 
Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. Regiscollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there. And we are back talking all about idiosyncratic FAs. But before we do that, I want to remind listeners that ABA Inside Track is ACE and Quaba approved. By listening to the show, you're able to earn one learning credit. All you need to do is finish listening then go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, and click on the Get CEs button. You can also find a link to the direct page to this episode in the show notes on your podcast player. However you get there, don't forget. In addition to some basic information, we also need you to enter one of the secret code words we've hidden in the episode. I'll give you the first one right now. It's POSTER, P-O-S-T-E-R. It's one of those pieces of paper, you know, you stick up on a wall. Maybe it's got a picture of, of, you know, something fun like your favorite Disney or Marvel characters. Maybe it's a movie poster. What kind of posters do you guys like? I like realist posters. Realist posters? Please stop hanging up posters. No, Diana does not want people to hang up posters. No, I'm, that's to you. I was oh. directed to you. I don't hang up posters. I put them in a nice frame now. Mm. Oh, okay. I'm getting a face. Anyway, poster. Don't worry. Diana won't write you a nasty letter when you put that in as the code word. Poster. She'll be like, please don't hang these up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I won't accept your code word. <laughs> I hate this. I remember that original that original argument. We start moving into a house, and then posters just start hanging. Yeah, no, that's oh. for college. I remember Matt had this huge Bjork poster mm-hmm. where Bjork is naked except for a leaf, yeah. and it was like in our dining room. And I was like, <laughs> <laughs> I was like, well, if you're gonna put this in here, you just have to put a frame around it. <laughs> Yeah, we have some good framed posters. We got some good like yeah, vintage really Disney, funny. you know. It was just kind of hilarious. And I was like, "There's a naked lady <laughs> in our living room." Not yeah, anymore. It's time to graduate beyond those. Oh, I'm still trying to find a place to put my big Akira poster because no, nothing says absolutely not cool guy like an '80s anime poster. No, it says hello. I got divorced recently. Hi. <laughs> okay. Anyway. Anyway. So, let's continue our, our journey through the idiosyncratic F.A. literature. I like how you said that, journey. Journey. Yeah. Welcome to England. I don't know where they say journey. Nowhere. Nowhere? Okay. Fairly certain. Okay, so now it's my turn to talk. I'm going to review the Jessel article from 2016. But in like in sort of this, seg- the segue that happened in, in your commercial time was that we're moving away from really thinking about identifying one particular function for whatever challenging behavior we're looking at, right? And so, like, that was a lot of those studies that you just reviewed, Rob, like, that was the ultimate goal. It's like, maybe it's, like, a funky function, right? Or maybe it's not exactly standard, but we're still going to identify this one thing that's going on. And it it was a little bit of a departure, I think, from, like, the standard IWATA quadrant in that there's these four big quadrants of behavior right positive social negative social tangible which is also positive social by the way and automatic and in the schlickemeyer paper like it still fits into one of those quadrants but we're not just defining it with such a big broad brush but we're still gonna say like yep this behavior is social positive maintained but it's only under these sort of smaller set of conditions And that was sort of part of this whole progression that we're discussing here. And then when we get to these other articles, once Jackie and I are going to talk about, which I think are going to have a lot of overlap in their, you know, overall view, because they're just continuations of the same same thing. We are moving into thinking about the application of the ISCA, but the point of which is to identify potential synthesized contingencies. So now we're no longer saying... Yeah, it looks like social positive attention, but under these specific set of parameters. And now we're instead saying, I think that there's a component of social positive attention here, but there's probably also a component of negative social attention present as well. And I know we've talked about this before because we've talked about the ISCA before, and we've had Dr. Jessel on as well to talk about some of these aspects too. But one of the theses, I guess you could say, of the ISCA is <laughs> Every time I hear theses, <laughs> I just giggle. Yeah, well, that's a great word. Is what Dr. Hanley says, you're never escaping from something to nothing, 
right? All of our environments are very complex, and it's never happening in isolation that there's only one variable at play. So the idea with the ISCA here is that, okay, not only is it probably a very specific, you know, idiosyncratic, individualized set of circumstances that this behavior is responding to, but likely there's not just one quadrant in which we're going to find these multitude of variables lying. There probably are going to be multiple components here that are contributing to the behavior. So the idea with the, the the Jessel paper and the ISCA generally is that we're going to identify these set of circumstances under which behavior is occurring. And that's all that we're really looking to do in this assessment phase, right? We're going to find the set of conditions under which we don't see challenging behavior occur. And then we're going to find the set of conditions under which we do see challenging behavior occur but it might be a whole, you know, paella of ingredients that Yum. are present <laughs> together. <laughs> and it's okay if we have extra ones in there potentially and we haven't singled out like the one exact one because we're going to move quickly from assessment to treatment and start to teach this individual how to access all of their preferred things instead. So that's kind of the idea here. In this Jessel study where they're really focused on FAs as they often happen in the standard format. It's taking a really long time. They can be inefficient. They often end up undifferentiated even after you run them out for a long period of time. And this idea that we are identifying behavior as being maintained in only one of those four quadrants is potentially being falsely parsimonious. So they review the research that's previously occurred that's like starting to kind of get at these different ways in which you might modify functional analyses. And then they say, now now let's look at the ISCA, which I just described why that might be important. So there were previous studies that already looked at and addressed the ISCA. The purpose of this one that I'm talking about today is that they wanted to review the replications and extensions of the ISCA that it had occurred since previous publications and also look to break down what they could determine about function even within session of an ISCA. So they compiled data that had been collected across numerous sites and with numerous participants and put them all together within the current study. So they had 30 different ISCA data sets that they were looking at, which represented 20 different participants, a range of ages from one year, eight months old, all the way up to 30 years old. The vast majority were male and the vast majority also had an ASD diagnosis, but not all of them did. And then the dependent variables here were exactly the types of behavior that you often see targeted for decrease, such as aggression, disruption, self-injury. And then for a few of them, there were also some loud vocalizations as well. And then they went through the process of the ISCA, right, which includes the interview. And then in order to determine the hypothesized contingencies and whatever variation of synthesized presentation they might have. And then a very quick test control comparison. So we're no longer doing those four different standard FA conditions. Rather, we have just a control condition in which all the good stuff's there and a test condition in which the good stuff is presented contingent upon the challenging behavior. And that might honestly only look like five sessions. Mm -hmm. Control, test, control, test, test. <laughs> Mm -hmm. There's a <laughs> test there on right. the end. There's a real magic when you can get those five those five conditions, right? especially when you can do like shorter conditions. Usually that's five. I know that they went from like three to like three to fifteen in, in some of these up some of these 10. thirty up to yeah. ten. Mm -hmm. But when you when you do the three minute conditions and you get that differentiation after five and you're like, Wow, I did this whole thing in less than an hour. The interview created the protocol, ran the test, and we're we're doing treatment within right. less than an hour. It there is something that just feels very magical. Right. And it's this is not just beneficial for you as a practitioner, but it's highly beneficial for your client as well. Because the time that you spend in assessment is the time that is important for you to understand what's happening, right? But it's mm -hmm. not a period of learning for your client. They are still engaging in whatever challenging behavior it is that has brought you into the picture. So the longer that that assessment period lasts, the more delay there is before they can start learning what's going to be meaningful and functional for them. So the quicker you can get in and out is uh, highly rewarding on all sides. So like I said, I'm not going into the details on the interview process. You can listen to that in our episode on the ISCA. 
But in the control condition of the assessment portion here, in the control, all the putative reinforcers are present. So all the potential good stuff is going to be there. If it's experimenter or parent attention, that's going to be present. If it's no demands happening, that's going to be present. If it's like playing with your dinosaurs while talking about all your favorite things and asking your parent to go make silly sounds, then all of that's going to be present. If problem behavior occurred during this, it would not have been particularly consequated because, again, all the good stuff was there. And then in the test condition, it's really just the opposite of that, right? So in this one, the all the good stuff's available, but it's only going to be presented upon occurrence of the challenging behavior for a fixed duration of time, and all the good stuff is presented at once. So it's not like, oh, today we're testing for the attention piece. Today we're testing for the escape piece. It's whatever was synthesized and hypothesized is all thrown in together. Another thing I think is important to mention for folks is that they did not only consequate whatever was the most troubling, challenging behavior. They also consequated identified precursors, too. So if whining consistently preceded aggression, then they would consequate the whining instead based on the not just hypothesis, because there's published data on this, too, but the idea that these are behaviors belong to the same response class. So that's I think it's overlooked sometimes, right? And that's another way that you can make your FA be more efficient and more safe. I think we talked about that with when Dr. Rodney Raman point, yes. was on one of the episodes <laughs> that, that we all did together. I think Dr. Jessel's article, even back late in CFA, we were talking about yep. that idea. Yeah. Well, maybe not precursors so much as just, but just first instance of. I know yes. we talked about it with Dr. Joey Stobitz on our episode on the emotional behavioral mm-hmm. disorders treatment, because that was an article looking at precursors. We have another one that we'll be doing. But yeah, talking about magic, when you can do your assessment in about 20 minutes and you never even had to see the worst form of problem behavior, right, you yeah. just saw the precursor. Now that, that you feel like you've really accomplished something amazing that day. Yeah. <laughs> so if anyone's like trying to get their head around this, the idea here is that you can think about all of the EOs were arranged and present for all reinforcers simultaneously during that test condition, right? So like everything was sort of set up. And then and the opposite was in the control condition. So here it was an AO that was arranged for all the reinforcers Ayo! simultaneously. Sorry. <laughs> okay. So then, and then the study just goes through. They're like, boom, that's how we did. We ran these sessions. They were all like five to 10 sessions each. And they put a big old beautiful table in there that described what the behavior was for each of the participants and then what they found to be maintaining in the synthesized contingency condition. So I'm just going to give you some examples of what those synthesized contingencies looked like so that folks have an idea of it. So here are some of them. Escape from teacher directed to child directed activity, such as the dinosaurs, the drawing, right? Access to social interaction and playtime with mom. Escape to child directed conversation topics. Access to iPad. Escape from task to singing with the experimenter. Escape from social interactions, period. Escape from physical prompting to preferred activities. Those are both yours. <laughs> what, the when I read that one, I was like, <laughs> escape from social interaction, period. I'm like, yep. Yep. <laughs> and physical prompting. <laughs> yeah. Yes. No, thank you. Escape from vocational tasks to self-stimulatory activities. <laughs> That's I, what I want. <laughs> no. I even know Diana's precursor behavior in those social situations. <laughs> Me too. You yeah. don't have to scream and yell. You sort of just you tense up, right? you flare your nostrils, yes. and you kind of shake your head just a little bit. It's like, yep. oh, better. Yep. Nope. Gotta allow go. allow like, for escape. Allow for escape. Yeah. He also helps the children identify my precursor behaviors, too. He's like, that. everybody, yeah. run, He's run. like, look at mom right now. Look at her. How is she feeling? What should you do to fix this? <laughs> no, I know. We just, we just run. We run out of the house as quickly as possible. <laughs> All right. Access to snacks. Another one that feels personally <laughs> relevant. Escape from gross motor activities to activities with mom's attention. Escape from tasks to child-led activities and compliance with requests. Sometimes you guys hear about like that as a potential variable, right? And then the last one I mentioned, escape from academic tasks to and divided attention to full attention. Mm-hmm. So that's just a sampling, right, of the gamut of different things sure. that could be in the synthesized contingency conditions. And they're all going to be individualized for your client and what you learned through that interview process. And potentially observation. And observation, yes. yes. They also note that... In 23 of these 30 cases, both negative social and positive social components of the contingency were present. So, like I said before, rarely do you escape to a vacuum. And then the graphs are so clear. They're also beautifully differentiated. 
19 of them only needed five sessions, the control test, control test, test, in order to make this differentiation. Seven of them needed six sessions, two needed seven sessions, and only one needed 10 sessions, which meant that the mean duration for completing the ISCA was 25 minutes. In eight cases, they needed to make a tweak to what they did, and so did a secondary or a tertiary analysis, but in 22, they got it right the first time. And 27 out of the 30 of these were completed in one single one-hour visit. Boom. Yes, exactly. I love those I love those graphs. I feel like it's that scene, you know, in Elf, when they're trying to, the writers are trying to, they got Peter Dinklage's, like, book of great children's book ideas, and then they're, they're showing with James Caan, and then the one guy opens and he goes, look at this! And he kind of points to it and he makes his face like, huh? And like, as the audience are like, that is like, I don't, I don't get it. But he just is so clear. Like the thing I pointed to, it's so amazing. I feel like when I'm showing people Iska grass, I'm like, look at this. <laughs> and they're just kind of like, all right, do, do what you will with that. Oh my goodness. All right. And then just briefly in study two, they did a within session analysis of the initial test sessions. And this was based on Roan et al. 1999, when they went and looked within session of FA conditions to determine. What? No, I'm just like, this This section of the article, it feels like they're flying too close to the sun. They're like, 25 minutes was good, <laughs> but two minutes? Wouldn't that be better? <laughs> you know, they had all these data. They might as well look at them. I like that. Right. So the idea here is that... I don't think parents would like two minutes. I, I mean, if I someone was like, I'm going to figure this out in <laughs> two minutes, I'd be like, you're BSing me. I know. I feel like at that point, you might as well just be like, well, thanks for all the information from your interview. Sounds like this. I'll just assume that's what it is. <laughs> yeah. But you can't be certain. No, I know you're you, running the I, I know you Wasn't can't. It for a while that they were, they had talked about even getting rid of the observation. It's, yeah, it's not that they, they don't usually do the observation uh, anymore. It's not that you can't do an observation. It's just it is not a requirement yeah. of the. I still think it should be. If you've never seen the kid before and you're just walking into an assessment without ever seeing the kid, that oh. seems funk to me but i, think, I mean that's just yeah. me. maybe because i'm old school remember because i'm you know because you're old because i'm old so right. maybe that's why but well that's what aubrey daniel says right you got to show me that yeah let me see the problem right and then you will understand it a lot better yeah mm-hmm. so but that's me uh, i don't know i think there's always something to the idea of you know sharing with the caregiver you know I, you are the expert of your child you are the expert of of what's going on right now so you know, is, is it potentially, I think, I think it's more the efficiency, but there's always that potential of like, okay, so it sounds like this, but I won't believe it till I see it. You lying, you know, parent or caregiver. Yeah, I don't or say teacher. that. I say, of course, I would hope you don't say that. It just gives me more information. <laughs> That's true. I have done observations. I've run a lot of ISCAs though. I have not done the observation and I have gotten really, really but good results. you know results. the client. Not always. Depends. Certainly in some situations I have. In some situations, I'm just like, well, let's do this and we'll see what we get. Yeah. Because, again, the other thing is you're looking at precursors. You're taking about 25 to 30 minutes. So the worst thing that happens is you don't get strong results or you start seeing problem behavior in the control. You can always call it off and say, all right, we're not going to keep doing this. I, you know, we'll do the observation. So, you know, one could say, what if you did an observation first? But I do find it can be very hard to schedule the time to do the observation and then get the right context present, Mm -hmm. especially if you're looking and say like a general education classroom where teachers are usually flexible. But the idea of could you set up exactly what needs to happen? That happens to be the day when that kid is he's never behaved like this before. And then you're like, all right, well, I've added another two hours to this overall process. So it's the pros and cons to whether it should always be included or not included. Okay. Well, in Rowan et al. 1999, they looked within the regular FA conditions to see if the behavior was occurring within session in intervals in which the reinforcer was present or reinforcer was absent. So you would expect to see behavior occur when the reinforcer is absent, right? So in that sense, they kind of like broke each session down into test and control pieces, right? Kind of like in the ESCA. And in the Jessel study, they wanted to see if they saw the same patterns of responding occur. So if the resp- if the reinforcer was present, you wouldn't expect to see behavior. If the reinforcer was or challenging behavior, if the reinforcer was absent, you would expect to see challenging behavior. And guess what occurred? What? Behavior. The challenging behavior was present almost exclusively in reinforcer absent intervals. So even within the already truncated test control arrangement within session if you use the same test control model within the session you got the same results that's why trial mm. best study phase work just put it out there mm. <laughs> it may take a lot longer than 25 minutes though and then i wrote they graphed it all which ways <laughs> we got so many ways to graph it but that was the result 
Yeah, that's, that's it. That's fun. I like study one, study one the best of these two. Study two felt like they're a little bit too much of a victory lap. Like, let's, let's slow down a bit. <laughs> that's great. Let's, let's hold off. <laughs> All right. All right. Now we I'm moving it. on. I'm moving on to my study. Okay. Moving on to my study, which talks about the Which is ISCO. what if that study, but then we just talked about what you could do after this study. After this study. So this one was 2020. So what they wanted to do was review all of the ISCA research. And then if they had completed their ISCA, would there be treatment results with those? The effectiveness of the ISCA and limitations across all of the variables. I'm not going to put them in there because there's all of them. They're like, of course, the participants, settings, yeah. behavior. We don't need all that. And then some suggestions for future research. So the first and second authors conducted a literature review, and they looked at literature from 2014 to 2018. Sad that this was published in 2020. So it took two years. Reviews take it, it so takes long. It forever. Yeah, it's so much work. Anyway. But then that just lets the next person do another <laughs> know, article right? looking at a different 10 years. Even so, faster. I know. So one of the inclusion criteria is that they had to say ISCA in the article because... I mean, the components of the ISCA are not novel, mm -hmm. right? And they say that is that so you could, it could do a variation of an FA that's not an ISCA. So yep. they made to make sure that said at ISCA, they included all the studies that included experimental design and treatment results. So they found- Fun activity for your summer vacation, folks. You can read all of the articles published about the ISCA. Yeah, they're right here. Right Like here they're all article. there. Like you could read them all in not a long time. There's only 17 across five journals. I think I, I think that is a topic. I think I might have read all the ISCA articles <laughs> that are out there at this point. All the extant articles. I'm very excited about that. Yeah. So they conducted IOA on all of the articles and like they looked at demographics and treatment results and they got 99.3%. Man, when they do that, I'm always like, what happened to that point seven percent? <laughs> like, where were they varied? Did someone put age seven instead of age eight? <laughs> I just wish someone would always put that in there, but it doesn't matter. I just, I just love it when I want to know what that is. Like, why wasn't it a hundred? But someone spilled coffee funny. and they looked away and they're like, <laughs> "Nope, I'm holding firm that I did not see a problem in right? that second. And so then they looked at the treatment evaluations. They compared the effectiveness of the treatment based on the results of the ISCA. And so what they said is that it had to result in a 90% reduction in problem behavior. So they, how they looked at it is they compared the last three data points in baseline to the last three data points in treatment. Love it. Yep. So the results, they got right down to it. So they had 100, that too. 102 ISCA applications, which resulted in 89 participants. 97% of those ISCA applications were differentiated, which is awesome, right? And then 55 of them, so 14 studies, had treatment evaluations uh, following the ISCA. So it's important to note that six of the studies were not part of the Hanley original group in any permutation because that is one of the criticisms yeah. of the ISCA mm -hmm. is that only Dr. Hanley and all of his students perform the ISCA and no one else. That's but fair. And, and I think it's also tough in that in that Dr. Jessel has published a lot of studies that have titles right. like, you know, 500 ways to use the ISCA or like 70 replicas. Like he has used this procedure a lot. So when you look at the aggregate, so many of the ISCAs referred to in the studies were ones that he completed as part of his work, Including either this one. with he Dr. Is, Hanley or without Dr. Hanley. He so, is one of the authors on this yeah. uh, article as well. <laughs> so on the one hand, it is exciting that he's been able to do so many replications and then share that information. But yes, then it does bring into contrast the idea of like, well, you're kind of all, you know, friends. So maybe, right. you know, we have to be a little skeptical about this. Right. So the first thing, right. So the first thing that they looked at was the demographic of all the participants and the majority of the participants were zero to five. They had a diagnosis of ASD. Their problem behavior resulted in aggression, disruption, SAB or other. Most of the participants spoke in sentences and most of the settings was in a clinic. So they had a lovely little bar graph for each of those in table one. And then they looked at the analytic efficiency and control of the ISCAs. So they said most of the ISCAs were completed in 10 sessions or f five to 10 sessions with an average of five sessions. The duration of each session lasted between three to 15 minutes with a mean of five minutes. And then the duration of the ISCA itself without the observation or the interview was between 15 to 100 minutes to collect data. So with the average of 25 minutes. So the interview and observation took around 30 and 20 minutes, respectively. So they said that this entire ISCA could be done in potentially 90 minutes, and that would cost around $300. Okay. So I like that they just added that like dollar amount right there. And so what they found 
is because it was going to be done in 90 minutes and not longer for what standard FAs might say. They said it was about a 75% improvement in duration from the standard FA. Yeah. And so two studies that they reviewed compared the ISCA against the standard FA, the Slayton study and the Fisher 2016 study. We've talked about the Slayton study Mm -hmm. on the show. And for those two studies, 13 of the 14 participants produced differentiation in the ISCA, whereas eight of the 14 cases produced differentiation of the FA. So here we're seeing that the ISCA's better performing and how they're writing it, right? They say 80% of... The ISCAs had demonstrated strong experimental control versus 36% of the standard FA. And when we were looking only at the ISCA, the moderate was 8% and 3% had low experimental control. So what they suggested that ISCA produced effective treatment across all studies where they found that reduction in problem behavior at 90% and all but one study used functional communication study. Uh, functional communication training, and three studies did not report treatment. So they have all of those articles on table one. So that's like very helpful. Big table. Big table, right? So with the treatment extension, they looked to see whether social validity was assessed, and they said that it was assessed in 40% of all the participants with parent acceptability. That was high. But that's actually not that much, Mm -hmm. right? So they do say this is a limitation of the ISCA research. Only 20% of the studies on the ISCA assess for treatment maintenance effects, ranging from two weeks to six months. Generalization across all the variables, I don't think you need to know them all, was assessed Mm -hmm. in 47% of the studies, and only 20 assessed treatment integrity. Mm -hmm. So the authors state that this is a limitation of the ISCA research, but it's not only a limitation of the ISCA research. Like, this is also a limitation of the standard FA, the functional communication literature. It's basically a problem in our field as a a whole. And so they they did make that little caveat. And with the novel development section, they talked about how in many of the studies they use the omnibus man, Mm -hmm. which could be a my way component. And all of but two studies used that omnibus band and two studies taught specific mans. And the authors did slant heavily toward the omnibus man, suggesting that if you teach this, it can be used in a wide variety of settings. But if you're just training a specific response, then you have to keep training respe- specific responses. Can I make a request? Sure. I would like, instead of omnibus manned, I just want us to use the phrase ombus manned, like an ombudsman. But is that a man. No, no, oh. it's, an, it's not. It's I'm not like, quite the same thing. I, no, no, no. You're saying it fine. I just always want to say ombuds, um, ombudsmaned, ombudsmaned. I just think that sounds ombudsman more fun. Is a weird word. Yeah, it is. I know. So I try I think, it. Everyone try it out at home. Think, Let me know what you think. Yeah, and I think it's already yeah. a weird word. It's already a weird word. But what I would like is more data on that because I've seen it in clinical practice work very well, and I've seen it in clinical practice work horribly. Really, an ombuds, yes. ombudsman. Yep. And so I just. I haven't, I haven't, I would like to, maybe we'll just do one whole article. There there is is an article. No, no, many articles. I would like to see many replications that this is effective long term. And I just haven't seen that yet. So that's what I would like. So that's one of the novel developments that they should, that future research should look at this. There there is a recent article. I, it's, I haven't read it. It's in my folder of things that I can read when I have some like downtime at work, but I have not gotten to that one. (laughs) <laughs> downtime. Uh-huh. Um, I never have downtime. You know, you're waiting for a meeting to start, right? And you start yeah. reading the paper. Sure. That's exactly what my Take your notebook into the bathroom, you read the article. Well, there, you know. gross. What mine is, I just sit and stare. But, okay, so that's one of the novels. That's why I read all the ISCA articles, Jake. Because I constantly have one on my person at I'm all never, times. never touching you again. <laughs> here, here. Here's a stack of soggy literature for so, you. Stop. I, I always am a little bit skeptical. I've come around on the ISCA because I've seen some good results on it, I'm still skeptical of the Omnibus Man. Only because I have The Omnibus Man. Oh, whatever. I haven't seen it... I haven't seen it as successful, mm-hmm. right? So I don't know if that... The author suggests that should be the treatment. I don't... I think that's a little bit far-fetched, mm-hmm. right? But that's okay. That's for me, right? That's just me. Some people love it. I'm on board if this has been working, right? But I'm not on board if... We, I don't know, just, it's it's fine. If we're officially called the Ombudsman, would you like it more? <laughs> yes. They also highlighted that Fisher in 2016 found differing results from the ISCA and standard FA. And so they said that the ISCA might provide a standard positive. And so what the author suggests, which I love this idea because when I read that Fisher article, they're so very clearly not on board yeah. with the ISCA, is that we should have more research looking at the effects of both and then assessing the treatment 
following those because what that what they said which is very valid is that the fisher article conducted the fa and then the treatment based on the fa but not on the isca so we don't know right if it was a false positive or not right Mm -hmm. and then they i love this and i i might like highlight this and bring it to our students is they have a really nice discussion here affirming the consequent which is really hard to find yeah and i looked at it i was like Damn. Mm. So if you don't know, it's a logical <laughs> fallacy that says that if B is true, then A must be true. So if you run an ISCA and you don't necessarily 100% know the function because you actually never do, right? But the treatment is effective, then you say, oh, yes, this must be the function. Mm. So that's what the affirming the consequent means. Mm. And so I just I just love that they like pop that in there. And it's true. What one? It's true, right? You can't 100% say Because the treatment was effective based on my result, therefore the assessment was accurate. But at that point, does it matter? Right? And so that's the question we have to ask. Does it matter? One of the suggestions that people say is, well, if it stops working, you don't know which variable to manipulate. Mm -hmm. True. Yes. But... Or what if you can't actually change all of those variables in the natural environment, right? You have classroom full of kids. One is very sensitive to sound. One really wants to... You know, their reinforcer is making a lot of loud sounds. How do you accommodate both of them for as an example? But so the future research should really look at what happens if the results of the ISCA are not differentiated. Right. So it actually could take longer than the standard FA or if the treatment results are not working. So it might be longer than that 90 minutes, which hits up against that standard FA. And they said that there's been a lot of replications of the ISCA, but no one has modified it. So, no, no. According to 2020. So they're like, we should probably try this with trial-based FAs or late in There's CFAs. a trial-based ISCA article. I didn't like it very much. But right, much. that's what they're saying. More replications. Enhanced should be choice needed. model would probably be the next one, yeah. which which modifies the That's probably the most right. significant modification to the ISCA. But then, so they just recommend that you use the ISCA and the Omnibus Band at the end. <laughs> the people who love the ISCA recommend use the ISCA. But, which we, yeah. So oh, there you go. I thought it was a great, great. A great article, and I think it was a nice summary of where we should go next. Yeah. So we've discussed idiosyncratic FAs. We've discussed sort of how the ISCA kind of becomes the ultimate in idiosyncratic FAs, making the idiosyncratic what, syncratic? I don't know. And now we're going to talk really briefly about Quereminol's 2013 study, because one of the limitations in a lot of FA literature is what about the automatic reinforcement? Usually you see this as part of an FA. But again, I think for most of us who've worked in the field or done a number of these assessments, you sort of have that sense of it's either socially maintained problem behavior or it's automatically maintained problem behavior. Yet neither of these assessments, whether it's sort of you know your idiosyncratic standard FA or your idiosyncratic modifications to your standard FA or your ISCA will always catch that. With your idiosyncratic standard FA, you run the risk of, well, if I know it's automatic, why am I running all of these other conditions which add a lot of time to the assessment? And if it's the ISCA, Josh writes in the article, the ISCA is not meant to determine automatic function of problem behavior. That's in most of the ISCA literature. It's all about socially mediated problem behavior. So you're not going to get an automatic function. And it doesn't make sense to run an ISCA and then say, I didn't get any results. I better say it's automatic. That's the same problem as saying, I'm going to run all of the conditions of an FA. So Quarium and colleagues said FAs are taking too long, especially when you have a sense of kind of, you know, I think the hypothesis, the hypothesized function is likely going to be automatic reinforcement. Why are we running all these other conditions? Could we look at a combination of some of the brief FA literature from Northrop in the 90s or the hierarchical model of FA condition presentation from uh, Volmer and colleagues in 95? Could we sort of look at this to determine whether or not we can make what would we refer to here kind of as a screening process for automatically maintained behavior? So the goal here was what if we just did some brief exposures to it alone or a no interaction condition and then we saw the results? If we get results, then the behavior is most likely maintained by automatic reinforcement. If we don't see any meaningful results, it's most likely maintained by so some sort of socially mediated variable. So you can continue on with whatever assessment format you choose, but don't use the alone no interaction condition because it is probably irrelevant at that point. 
So most of the participants in this study, the problem behavior was stereotypy, mainly because that is almost always maintained by automatic reinforcement to the point that you almost want to say, oh, stereotypy is the problem behavior. It's automatic reinforcement. Move on. We we don't necessarily want to do that, but could we do things a little bit faster? And actually, this is why I love this study, because this was my little bit faster. I want to make sure screener that I've used for years and years now. So what if we take a screen where we have multiple five-minute alone, no interaction conditions, and then we just sort of run them? And then we'll compare that to an FA with a standard 10-minute duration. We use all the standard conditions afterwards, and then we see what are the comparable results. Now, while stereotypy was the main problem behavior assessed, they also wanted to look at other problem behaviors that are less likely to be maintained by uh, socially mediated uh, function or socially mediated variables like aggression, self-injurious behavior, and they looked at uh, environmental destruction as well. So they had about 30 cases, 26 subjects. Some of them had different topographies of problem behavior that were assessed separately. So they'd always start with a screener. So again, just a bunch of five-minute alone or no interaction conditions with a minimum of three sessions. They'd put like a two minute break in between, go to the bathroom, let's get some water, let's go take a walk. They weren't, you know, they're very clear, like, we're not going to tell anyone what to do in those two minutes. There's just got to be two minutes between the sessions. Then they'd run a typical FA with a loan or no interaction condition, an attention condition, a play condition, and a demand condition. They used a fixed sequence. Again, you don't have to necessarily do that, but they did. Afterwards, they got a bunch of BCBA buddies together and said, take a look at these graphs. What do you think? And everyone came to a consensus as to the function of the behavior. And sort of the patterns they saw, if there was a lot, a high rate of problem behavior or high level of problem behavior for three or more screening sessions, the behavior was considered to be maintained by automatic reinforcement. If they saw problem behavior that was the highest in the alone or no interaction condition of uh, the subsequent FA, then it would be considered also automatic reinforcement and a hit. So the screener was correct. It matched with the functional analysis. If they saw high rates of the problem behavior in all of the conditions, they also considered that automatic reinforcement and, again, could be a hit if both the screener and the analog FA uh, results sort of coincided. If the screener predicted a downward trend in the problem behavior or the problem behavior occurred at near zero rates, it was considered that the problem behavior was likely maintained by some sort of social variable. And again, if the problem behavior in the FA then was highest in either the attention or the demand condition, then the function was identified as attention or escape, the two social, socially mediated functions. And if there was agreement between the screener and the FA, that was also a hit. So that's what they were looking for. If the screener predicted automatic reinforcement and the FA didn't, that was considered a false alarm. If the screener predicted social function and the FA didn't, that was a miss. So again, we were looking at, would the screener pick up the wrong function and then set up a practitioner to use the wrong treatment or non-function-based treatment? Or would the screener misdirect individuals to completely missing the function as automatic, which would be you know the miss? So Of these 30 cases, 28 of the 30 cases done with the screener matched or predicted the function the same as the traditional FA. Again, usually the function was considered automatic. Sometimes it was considered social. And within those two functions, so when it was the screener said, this behavior is maintained by automatic reinforcement, there was one mismatch. And then when the screener predicted this is socially mediated problem behavior, there was one mismatch between the screener and the FA. So overall, two total Uh, either a miss or a false alarm. There was one of each, actually. Most of the time, you know, 21 of the cases, the screener predicted automatic reinforcement, meaning the other nine were some sort of social mediation. Again, two of the times there was on a match between the FA and the screener. But again, when you're just so... That's a pretty high hit rate. I would I would feel comfortable using this screener most of the time. Since we've moved on, I think with some of the technologies we can use to do behavior assessment, I do feel that the screener process really is going to only be effective when you're looking at behavior that is likely maintained by automatic reinforcement. You run a couple of loan conditions. If you're seeing high high you know high rates of problem behavior, great, you're done. Don't do any more assessments. It's most likely maintained by automatic reinforcement. Now, the study then kind of goes on to look at, but what if you saw this pattern in the data in the screener? This might point to it being, you know, attention maintained or or escape maintained. I felt kind of similar to how in the Jessel article where they're sort of, but what if we, it's okay, you're, 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 make one point and you stick with it. You made it very well. Don't keep going with this one. You probably want to do a separate study. It's it's sort of my thought on those endpoints. So I'm not going to get into much more detail on that. But again, you can look at patterns of within session analyses and do all sorts of fun things. 
I'm not as interested in some of that component because I do think it gets a little too. You're starting to scrape the bottom of your of your <laughs> of your study barrel at the end. Interesting, interesting stuff. You don't need to get rid of it, but again, I think that's not necessarily the main point of this article. The main point here is I think this is a very great little screener that you can use when you believe behavior may, may be maintained by automatic reinforcement. It is very fast. And when you're done, you either do more assessments because it's socially mediated problem behavior, or you may write a treatment based on the function of automatic reinforcement. And so again, one of the more, I don't know if that's necessarily idiosyncratic, but I didn't know where else to put this article and we never talked you about just it, love it. And I wanted to talk about it. That's so okay. I think it's a good go. one to talk about. Yeah. And it's specifically mentioned in, in, in the other articles as, you're what like, do you do? Yes. If, yeah. When you saw that, you're probably like high-fiving yourself. We can finally talk about it's it. Weird. And I don't see it cited as much as I would think. Like I see Me it too. occasionally cited, but it's one of these articles. Like I, I, like I have protocols from back in like probably 2013, 2014, where I'm like, you know, here you go. If, if you're seeing this as a problem behavior or, you know, if you want to support like stereotypy treatment, like make sure you do this screener for like, I've been, I've been citing this forever now and I just don't see it too often or mentioned yeah. too often. So I don't either actually. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm going to give it a little love right here. Thank you, Angela Quare and, and colleagues, for your great article that I shoved into this episode. And thanks, Jackie and Diana, for letting me talk about this article after too, too long. But I think I think this is probably the closest artic- uh, episode topic we're going to have where it would fit. Yeah. All right. And now it sounds like we're moving into Dissemination Station. <laughs> so it's kind of funny that when – if we'd done this art, this episode like, what, five years ago or it had been like our second episode on the show, I feel like we would have really spent a lot of time talking about, well, idiosyncratic variables and FAs, you know, we've got to look at more research to identify them. But now doing it here, I think it is almost a historical – it's not quite a historical curiosity, but I think it's getting to a point where looking at idiosyncratic variables in FAs, in standard FAs, is is almost like, well, why would you do that? Wouldn't you just run an ISCA? Wouldn't you just do the PFA process? Like, doesn't that just make more sense? Because that's going to capture those idiosyncratic variables in a way that we don't have. I mean, I don't know of any research that better targets what do you do when your FA comes up bust, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. So in some ways, I think it's well, in many ways, it is definitely important, I think, for behavior analysts to understand how we got to where we are. I know for me, I don't have any supervised Zs this year, but I've had a supervised Z or two for man, the past whole bunch of years. Mm-hmm. And I make every single one of them run a standard functional analysis, even though I know I could say, we're just going to do an ISCA, it's going to take a lot less time. Because I do, I did think at the time that there wasn't enough research to support, like, you just use the ISCA all the time, it's fine. This is the best one now. And I wanted them to understand as practitioners and behavior analysts why this technology was still relevant and why, if they choose to go, you know, the PFA route, why that would make sense. Like why that is such a cool extension Mm -hmm. of the functional analysis research, how it came out and why they wouldn't use it, why they would use it and what they would do if they weren't getting meaningful results because they have to understand the thought process that goes behind it. But now, so many years on and so many replications in research, even though, you know, there's still new directions and still questions to ask. I'm starting to wonder if I have supervisees next year or if I start having supervisees this year and they say, I got to do a functional analysis, will I tell them we're going to do a standard and analog FA? I don't think so. Or will so. I even bother anymore? And just say, you know what, there's so. enough research, use this one now. And to be honest, that sort of takes care of the idea of idiosyncratic FAs. So, you know, is, is this a problem that kind of got solved in a way? Man, eh, not, not quite, but I'm feeling more on the side of yes solved than no solved. What a difference a few years makes. What a difference a few years makes. And if you're not using the Quarum at all screener for your potentially automatically maintained behavior, like, what? come on, what else do I need to do to convince you? What do I need to do to get you into an automatically maintained screener today? Mm, that's funny. <laughs> what are your thoughts, Jackie? Where are you? Because I know you, are, you I am, I'm clearly the one that is hot on the ISCA, whereas I think you and Diana are not as hot on the ISCA. I think... There, the ISCA is a is a great and useful tool, and I have 
now that I've seen more research about it and we've seen more replications, I am more on board with using Inisca than I had been in previous years. You know, I'm I'm fairly skeptical. Mm -hmm. And so I wait until things come out, right? And I see more research around it. I don't know if I'd always ever do the Inisca, mm -hmm. though, right? So, I again, I do really love that I want in Dozer 2008 article where it shows you all the different things that you can do. Because if I know that it might just be this attention component, I just might do a pairwise analysis very quick, right? That also will be really quick. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to do the standard, mm -hmm. you know, and it's very similar to an ISCA because that's basically what the ISCA is. Yeah. <laughs> this is a pairwise. And so, you know, I, I think I might not always do an ISCA, but I'm always going to do an assessment, mm -hmm. right? And so based on what I find out from that interview. And I, I do recommend observations. I, I know that, that you don't have to, but you know, I'm old school. Mm -hmm. I'm like an old lady. And I like to kind of see and know what I'm getting into before I get into it. And so in, in my field, in, you know, in, in my recommendations, I'd say, okay, do the interview. Love that. I think everything should be informed by the interview, yes. right? Love that. Include that. But if it does say that it might be one of these single variables, then I'm just going to run a pairwise. Mm -hmm. Right. And, Sometimes that is, it's as simple as that. It's like every time you place a demand, <laughs> the kid hits you in the face, right? Mm -hmm. And so I think I think you have to see what's going to be useful for you. Yeah. And and I wouldn't I don't I don't always recommend something, right? Yeah. I think as as science practitioners, we need to be thoughtful and look at all of the different variables that we have in in store for us and choose what's going to be best for our client right now and yeah. what's best for our clinic in our school setting right now. Mm. Yeah, I I I definitely agree, Jackie. And, and it's funny I mean, I guess it probably points us out as as old. It does, <laughs> as but it's old okay. In the idea that I like knowing that I have so many different types of assessments I could run, and my professional judgment based on the information I have is mm -hmm. still a marker because it's not that one or one or of the other of these is not evidence based. So like no, if you do the ISCA, there's right. not enough in evidence based. You shouldn't. Or if you're still doing an FA, the evidence points to something else as being you know always the better treatment. I don't think we're there yet. No, we we may we may get there one way or the other in you're the next right. couple of years. Mm -hmm. But I don't think we're quite there. So if you decided you know and, and I've had situations where I do feel like you said of like you know what I feel like if I do an ISCA, I'm going to get a lot of noise and I really feel that there is a individual function and perhaps the standard FA is going to be the fastest way to identify yes or no. And I've even had that in the past like two, two, three years where I said, you know what, as much as I probably would do an ISCA 99% of the time, given some of the same information, there's something about this case that I feel standard FA is going to give us the exact information we need and we'll get the exact results that I'm predicting here, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think it's, it, while it's good to know, I, I do think it, it, we are going to see more and more practitioners who are hopefully running some sort of FA themselves, mm -hmm. but who are probably not running a standard or an analog FA and, and may never have. And unlike now, when people tell me that and I say, and, you know, if they've been in the field for more than two or three years and they say, I've never run an FA, I go, what? what? And I give them a nasty look, you know, where they might say, well, I've run like the PFA. I've done some trial based. I've never run an analog FA. I'll go, oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah. People don't run those true. as much as they used they to. They don't, yeah. I, I, I there's think that's reasons true. why. Yeah. I mean, right? We've talked about them. Yeah. All right. Well, before we wrap up, I want to make sure that we move on to Diana and her pairings segment. All right. So it's time for your favorite moment in the show. It's pairings. Here, I'm going to tell you what you should eat while you listen to this show and what other episodes you should listen to if you liked this one. We should do this first if you want people to be eating this while listening to the show because well, the show is almost over. <laughs> well, you can you know make this later and then reflect. While you read the articles while that we discussed. Articles. Exactly. Exactly. So I, I still working on pairings. Presenting two snacks for you for today, and just full disclosure, we're recording this on a Sunday morning, so these are also both perfect brunch opportunities for you. The first is a spinach quiche, and the reason why I've chosen spinach quiche because there's an unlikely ingredient in a spinach quiche that makes it delicious. Do you know what it is? Eggs. Turmeric. <laughs> no <laughs> spinach. No those. Well, those are obvious ones. The <laughs> unobvious one is nutmeg. <gasps> nutmeg really brings out the flavor of spinach and you wouldn't really expect it this is relevant because sometimes in these types of analyses there's a hidden secret ingredient being one of the maintaining variables that actually makes it all work together so you could definitely have that for brunch but you could also have some coffee cake 
And I'm bringing this up because if you go back and listen to an early Greg Hanley talk, it's available on YouTube, where he's discussing like the, you know, initial versions of the ISCA. He's talking about this idea of synthesized contingencies. And he says, maybe you like eggs, maybe you like flour, right? Maybe you like sugar, but each of those things individually is probably isn't going to maintain your behavior in the same way as if I combine them all together and make a delicious coffee cake, right? The end product of those things being synthesized together is much more rich, delicious, and reinforcing than the individual ingredients and components. So that's his comparison for individual maintaining variables versus synthesized. And that's why you might also enjoy a coffee cake while you listen to this episode. Finally, if you liked this, there are many other episodes you might want to go back and try. Episode 7, where we discuss trial-based FAs, might interest you. Episode 66, where we had Dr. Joshua Jessel on to discuss latency-based FAs, might interest you. Episode 110, where we had Dr. D2 Rajaraman on to discuss the ISCA, might interest you. Episode 166, where we had Dr. Jessica Slayton on to discuss the history and evolution of functional analyses, might interest you. Or our recent episode 231, where we had Dr. Joey Stobitz on to discuss emotional and behavioral treatment and variations on assessment, might interest you as well. So feel free to enjoy any of those. Thank you so much, Diana, for these delicious pairings. You're welcome. Well, that brings us to the end of our episode. Thank you all so much for listening. We hope you enjoyed the show. We'd love it if you subscribed to the show. If you're interested in hearing even more ABA Inside Track, a lot of ways you can do that. You can certainly email us at abainsidetrack at gmail.com. Go to our website, abainsidetrack.com, to find links to all of the articles that we discussed, as well as to purchase CEs. You can go to our YouTube page where all these episodes come out. You can listen to them there as well. You can find emails. Even more ABA Inside Track on our Patreon page, patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track, where you can subscribe for $5 a month to get everything a week ahead of time to get some free CEs for our live episodes. We actually, I'm not sure exactly whether we just recorded or about to record, but it's coming out sometime this month, our recording where we continued to dive into the history of behavior analysis and conversion therapy. And we discussed, of course, the ethical challenges there and some of the steps that researchers took back in the the 70s and you know potentially could we fall into backing the completely wrong horse in terms of where treatment should go in the future and what can we do to avoid ever having that happen again and potentially doing harm to our clients and the people who are counting on us to support them and their needs. So that is an episode that if you're a subscriber, you already got that and you already saw it and you already got a free CE for it. You can even subscribe at the $10 level to get access to our super long book club podcast. We recently did the parenting book between now and dreams. And this spring we have another one coming out. It is going to be Calling Bullshit, a book all about skepticism in our data world. So if you want to get access to that, it's only available on patreon.com slash ABA Inside Track. Oh my goodness, Jackie, I almost forgot. We want a second secret code word, don't we? We sure do, Rob. I love putting it at the end of the plugs so that people have to listen to them all. (laughs) The second secret code word is Steamboat, S T. E-A-M-B-O-A-T. Not something you see very often, but at one point was the height of transportation. Whoa, is it slightly analogous to some of our topics that we discussed today? I don't know. Or maybe I just saw it in a book that's on my shelf, and that's why we got the code word steamboat. All right. Some final big thanks. Big thanks to Dr. Jim Carr for recording our intro and outro music, to Kyle Sturry for creating our interstitial music, and to Dan Thabit of the Podcast Doctors for his amazing editing work. We'll be back next week with another fun-filled episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye! Bye! Bye!